As we uh, look in the, the book of 1 Corinthians, it's, uh, it's written to the Corinthian church. So like this is the Pearsall Road Church. It's written to the, to the Corinthian church. And um, it's, a, it's a letter that he wrote to them, giving them encouragement and help, uh, where he had been there and, and taught for 18 months. A fellow was uh, getting low on gas, so he pulled into a gas station, and as he pulled into the gas station, he put the tank on, and he was filling it up, and he decided to run inside after he filled up and pay the bill and get him a Coke at the same time. So he got him a Coke and walked back outside, and he was standing by his car there drinking the soda before he got back in, and uh, he noticed two men doing something alongside the road. And as he looked at them, this one guy came along and he dug a, about a two to three foot hole in the ground. And then after he dug the hole, he moved on. He'd go down about 25 feet and he started the process again. And it was another man that came along after him and he came to the hole that had been dug just moments before and he filled the hole in. It didn't make sense to him. He watched, and as the other man finished the hole, he moved on to the next 25 feet down and started digging again. And sure enough, here came this guy. He came down, and he covered the hole up again. He stood there and watched. Dug the hole. The other guy came up, filled up the hole. Finally couldn't take it anymore. He sat his soda down, and he walked over to the two guys, and he said, What in the world is going on? What are y'all doing? He said, well, we're government workers. That should have explained everything. He said, we're government workers. And he said, I was hired along with two other guys to take and plant trees. You see, today Sam's sick. And Sam's the one that puts a tree in the hole. And Jesse and I are the ones that I dig it and Jesse fills it up. Well, Sam was sick, but that don't mean we shouldn't be able to work and earn a living. So we're doing our job, but Sam's homesick today. You know, I think sometimes in the church, Paul was talking about, sometimes in the church, we're just doing our job. And we don't stop to think how it merges in with the work of the church of the other people that are part of it too. When somebody's missing, it makes a difference. Somebody needs to catch up and do that work. One of those two men should have been putting a tree in the hole, right? Wouldn't that make sense? But they weren't hired to put a tree in a hole. They were hired, hired to dig a hole and to cover up a hole. And they weren't going to change their mind about it. And that's the way it is in church work sometimes, Paul's saying here in 1 Corinthians 3. He's saying sometimes in the church we show up, we do our job, we go away and we're not concerned whether our job is followed on by those other people and whether the whole thing together is accomplishing the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is very clear. Let me make real certain we all understand the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church, are you ready for this? Is to win and disciple people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Win implies new people because you can't win the people that are already here You have to first dig the hole. You have to bring somebody in. You have to win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are people that God lays out in every congregation who do different jobs and calls them to those spiritual gifts. And the responsibility is there. Well, what do we do if somebody does not bring anybody new in? What do we do? Do we say, well, I wasn't hired to bring people in. I was just hired to take and and teach them when they got here. Well, I think sometimes we think that way. And we take our job and we see it in isolation instead of as a part of the church. Now, we need to make sure that we understand, too, what do we mean by the term the church? Well, the church is not these four walls. The church is each one of us coming together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and to accomplish what He intends to happen in this church service. There's preparation that has to be done. Some people need to be busy doing that. People need to be busy bringing people in. And other people need to be busy welcoming those people. And others need to be busy teaching those people. 
And other people need to be fellowshipping with those people, making them feel comfortable. Other people need to be taking and watering those by taking and, and finding out what's going on in their life and encouraging them. Thank you tonight, Larry, for leading our prayer time. That was a way right there of finding out what's going on in people's lives so that we not only can be praying for those things, but we can also speak to the people who have prayer requests and encourage them in the things that they're asking about. Show that we not only are here, but we care about what's going on in their lives too. As we think about this, the church is blinded today, I believe, by assumptions. We believe that we just dig holes, or we just cover up holes, or we just put trees in holes. We've forgotten that the church it has a purpose, and that is to win new people and to disciple those people in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the purpose of the church. Make no mistake about it. Let's say that you own a business, and your business is to sell ice cream. And your job at that ice cream place is to sweep the floor. You show up and you sweep the floor. You don't care if anybody else shows up to, to, to do anything else. You don't care if people are there to serve the ice cream. You don't care if people are there to take the money. You don't care if customers are welcome when they come in. You just sweep the floor. How long do you think that business would last with attitudes like that in the employees? But the same thing goes in a church. Church has a purpose, to win and to disciple the people that God brings into the church. I want to think with you tonight is how we're to look at pastors. What is the job of pastors? I think sometimes people think pastors are there at the church and their responsibility covers it all. We're just to show up, enjoy the show, and uh, maybe say thank you, and maybe say good job, but our job is just to show up and watch the show. That's not our job. Our job is to win people to Jesus and to disciple those people into the kingdom of God. That's, that has to be done. Now, each of us do different jobs in accomplishing that, but if somebody doesn't do one of them, we have to pick up the work that they don't do and accomplish it. Otherwise, we're just digging holes and filling them up, digging holes and filling them up, just like Sam and Jesse were doing, uh, just like uh, the man and Jesse were doing. Uh, they forgot that there's another responsibility, and that is to put a tree in that hole. Let's pray today. Father, thank you so much for loving us and providing us a church. That is a body of believers where we come together and together we work to accomplish your purpose for the church. Father, the purpose of the church is not being accomplished if we're not doing those two things. If that's not being accomplished in the church, it's not, being, it's not fulfilling the, the responsibilities of the local church. We ought to take and do something about that. There's two things we could do. Either we could pick up those responsibilities and do them, or we could just take and leave the church and go to find another church where people are doing those things and still not do them ourselves. Our responsibility is to fill in. When Sam is sick and away, we're to fill in and put the tree in the hole. Bless us, Lord, and speak to our hearts tonight as we look at this passage that Paul spoke to the church in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul begins with describing two levels of Christian living. The two levels of Christian living are, number one, carnal living. Carnal living is where we live for ourselves, we live for our pleasure, we live for the things of this world, we live for our money, we, we live for our pleasure, we live for our uh, health. We live. Carnal living is when we focus on the things that please us instead of the things that please the God who saved us. The second thing is spiritual. The second uh, level of Christianity is spiritual living. Spiritual living is to where we put ourselves last and we put others first and we put the job of Christ important in the, in the mix of things. That's what it's there. What is the job of a pastor? And I want to look at that as Paul takes and explains that. What was he doing and what were the people doing? Paul explains that the ministry begins with a pastor, and, and it, it doesn't end there. It just begins. He's the one that takes and, and gets the show together. He's the one that arrives early, so to speak, at the, at the ice cream shop and opens the door. 
He's the one that arranges for someone to get there early and to open the door. He's the one that buys the ice cream, or he's the one that gets somebody to buy the ice cream. He's the one that takes and serves the ice cream, or he's the one that gets somebody to serve the ice cream. He's the one that chooses the flavor, or he gets together the group that chooses the flavor. But the pastor is not the one that does the whole ice cream shop. His job is to coordinate and to get people to working and to doing different jobs instead of everybody showing up to take and sweep and nobody to do any serving of ice cream. As we look in this passage, we'll see it. Now, when he refers to a pastor here, he's using one of the roles of pastors. And the key role that he's using here is also the same term, the same purpose that a deacon in a church has, and that is to be a servant. A servant doesn't take the ownership role. A servant doesn't take the leadership role. A servant takes and serves. That's the responsibility. And pastors are to be servant leaders. They're to be people that get other people to doing the things in the church and then get out of the way and let them do it. And if they need guidance, to give the guidance. If they need encouragement, to give the encouragement. But the important thing that a pastor does is to bring together people to accomplish the role of the church. And what are the two roles of the church? To win people to Jesus and to disciple them. That means to help them to grow up. Service. That's the first thing that we see as the role of a pastor. If we look at pastors, we see that the first thing they're to do is to be a servant to other people. And they're to model that so that each person in the congregation realizes that they are to be a servant to the people in the church. Every one of us is to be a servant to the people in the church and to the gifts that come to our church and to, to the new Christians that are in our church and to the leaders in our church. We're to serve one another, and it's an important thing. When we become a Christian, God gives us a fork that's about 14 feet long. I want you to imagine Thanksgiving dinner tomorrow when you get your, your plate and you sit down to eat that you're given a fork that is 14 feet long. How much food are you going to eat? Well, you're not given the 14-foot fork to feed yourself. You're given the 14-foot fork to feed others. And they're to feed you. And the church will literally starve to death if they try to take and put it in their mouth all the time and they'll be beating each other up. Notice those two girls that were talking at the beginning. Who were they interested in? Themselves. Only themselves. And the results of it is that a good friendship broke up that day. That's what gossip does. It ultimately ruins the friendship with the people that you gossip with. That's the reason I, for one, hate gossip. Because Jesus hates gossip, it destroys good friendships and destroys uh, all that's going on with it. Servants. We're to be servants of other people. Not serving our plate, but serving other people's plate. Try that tomorrow. When it comes time to eat, take and put on some gloves, stand behind the turkey, and if people are getting up to get their turkey, say, can I serve you? Can I serve you? Instead of trying to get first in line and to get the best meat, wait until others have eaten before you eat. Try that. See how it works. One thing, everybody will look at you like there's something wrong with you. They won't understand. But that's the way we're to live in the church of Jesus Christ. The word minister means a deacon. It means a servant. Now, it means many different things, but in this particular chapter... That's what it's referring to, is the role of a pastor to be a deacon, is to be a servant leader. Eighteen months, Paul had been Christ's servant in this church. Now he's writing a letter back to him, And he explains to him in the first verses, and let's read those verses again, please. It says, For my part, brothers and sisters, I wasn't able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of flesh. You were carnal, he says. But as people of flesh, as babes of Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were just not ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready because you are still worldly. 
You're still in the flesh. You're carnal, he said right there. The word, the Greek word that's actually used there that we translate in worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, jealousy, the desire to take care of ourselves and other people can take care of themselves. Since you're still worldly, there's envy and strife among you and you're worldly and behaving like just mere human beings that showed up at church. And for whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, another says, well, I belong to Paulus. Are you not acting like mere humans choosing the people? Choosing who you want to be your leader and who you'll side with? We live in a world today where that's a, a, so political, where people choose this or they choose that and they hate the other. It won't work that way. We can never take and build a nation and maintain a wonderful nation if we're always at war with each other because of political views. We need to be serving one another. And the church is the place where that's learned. Jesus gave the church to equip the people individually so that they could go out and change the world in which we live. America used to be a place where people loved and cared about one another and fellowship with one another, and when they disagreed in something, they agreed to do something and go on with it together. We have lost that, and I submit to you the reason we've lost that in America today is because the church is not what Jesus intended it to be, and that is a serving church that brings people in and not only wins them to Jesus, but then disciples them, teaches them the way to live and the way to grow by teaching them the Word of God. We live in a time when there are just immature, that's the fill-in, immature Christians in the church of Jesus Christ today. A lot of immaturity, people that, uh, we had our, one of our grandsons this, uh, this last day or so, and we did things together, but do you know what the focus of attention was on our parts, the oldest part and mine? Was? What do you think the focus was? What? To make him happy. To take care of him. To encourage him. To give him a good time. Not what we wanted. Not what we wanted. Not what we needed. But what he needed. That was the focus of attention. And that's where it ought to be with people that come into the church. New Christians. As we mature and learn things, we ought to be better to be able to jump in. And if somebody doesn't show up to put the tree in, we ought to be ready to dig the hole and put the tree in. Or we ought to be ready to put the tree in and cover up the hole. We need to jump in and work together and serve one another. Look at Hebrews 5 with me, if you will. We have a great deal to say about this, Paul's talking. And it is difficult for me to explain it since you have become too what? Too lazy. To even understand what I'm going to tell you. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, teaching other people, teaching new people coming into the church, you still need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation, what God says. You need milk instead of solid food. Not everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness Righteousness is how to live the Christian life because there's still an infant. But solid food is for the mature. But those who have senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Now, most mornings I get up and uh, I have a what I call a milkshake. It's actually a, uh, a drink of different vitamins and and some different things that help me not only with diabetes, but also help me with weight and, and managing my, my life like that. Sometimes that's, I want to be immature. I drink that, but then I want also to eat solid foods. Now, can my body handle those solid foods? That's the question. You see, the, the reason that I drink the milkshake in the morning, it's not really a milkshake, you understand. It's a... Uh, a whole bunch of wheat <laughs> and uh, different vitamins and all that kind of stuff. The reason I drink that is because I'm not keeping my body in the shape it needs to be 
on my own, I choose wrong foods to eat, which hurt my body, hurt my blood sugar, and the different things that go on in it. So I take those to keep me, and, and it's supposed to stop my hunger so that I won't eat other foods. And then it gives me the vitamins that I need to kick off my day and to be able to go through life that day without hurting my body in the very beginning of the daytime. That's what we, when we came to know Jesus Christ, we were on a milkshake diet. People fed us, taught us the things that they did, and we couldn't pick up the Bible and study it for ourselves. We couldn't take and, and listen to a Bible teacher and get what's going on. We had to actually have people explain to us what they were teaching to us because we couldn't understand it when they taught it to us. It went right over our head. We had to go and ask somebody, what did he mean by that? What did she mean when she said this? As Christians that have been around for a while, and they have been around for 18 months under Paul's teaching, he said, I can give you solid food in the morning. You can't eat it. You won't take care of yourself if I give it to you. You'll hurt yourself. And so I have to take and still feed you this, this milkshake each morning. Not only are we immature, he said, we need to be servants. We need to place in order Christ first, others second, and ourselves last. But I'm afraid immaturity means that we place ourselves first, we place Christ perhaps second, but we place others, if at all, third. And that's not the way God intended it. When we become a Christian, we're to put others first, Christ next, and then we're to t I put Christ first, and then we're to put others next that we're teaching, and then we're to take and put ourselves last. God gives grace. He gives it as a gift to us. We have faith, not because we earned it or deserve it. We have faith and trust in God because He, as a gift to us, gave us the capacity to do that. Number two, not only are we servants to others, but we're also to be sowers of God's seed. We're to be sowers of God's seed. You see, the pastor has a responsibility. He's in the hand of God. He has a responsibility to teach the material. He has a responsibility to make sure that people hear it and, and it's taught in a way that they get it, give examples or illustrations or humor or whatever it takes for people to actually continue to listen, put notes in their hands, encourage them to take notes, getting them involved in Bible study where they take notes in church and look at their Bibles where they go away going home with something in their hand that they can sit down and review what they learn at church and get it to where they understand it so they, they, they can then take the same tools and teach it to somebody else. Until you teach to somebody else what you learn yourself, you're not accomplishing what God intends for you to do as a Christian. We're to be sowers of the gospel seed. Sowers, the good news seed. We get it, we're to give it away. Now, Paul, he changes the image here from a family to a field. He changes it from the family of God, the church, to a field. What happens in a field? To give it in a different light, to give it a different example of what the responsibilities are that he talked about in the first part when he explained it as a servant in the church where we each serve one another with a 14-foot fort. But here he uses a field. And he's going to take and explain it in terms of what happens in, a, in your, the farmer's field. The first thing that we see is turning to Scripture again, chapter 3, verse 6, is I planted, Apollos watered. You see, he would teach the people and Apollos would come along and he would reteach it or encourage it. He would water what Paul had taught, what he had taught. And, but God is the one that gave the growth. It was not Paul. It was not Apollos that gave the growth in people. It's not because of the teacher that you grow. It's because of God who takes what is taught and germinates it in you, and it grows up to become a plant. I planted, Apollo watered, but God, He's the one that gave the growth. And so then neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. You see, it's not me that gets you into heaven. It's not me that takes and teaches you how to study the Bible. It's not my responsibility to do those things. It's my responsibility to take and go through the Bible, 
show you how to read the Bible and to allow you to go, wow, I understand that. Boy, Stat's doing a great job of teaching me that. Wasn't me that did it. My responsibility is to read the Word of God, to talk about the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to take that material and make it sense to you to where you grow in it. Now listen to me. That friend of yours is not a Christian. Until you're willing to do what Paul and Apollo did, until you're willing to take and share Scripture with them, and then teach them about what's going on in there, you don't give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to change their life. You see, it's not up to you to win them to Jesus Christ. It is up to you to participate in the process by taking and planting the seed, by reading the Word of God and talking about it. It's up to you to do what Paula did, and that is to water it, to keep mentioning it and talking about it and encouraging them and, and patting them on the back and feeding them with a 14-foot fork. And it's up to the Holy Spirit, which He'll do if you put the Word of God out. He will take and grow it inside them to where a plant comes up. Have you ever noticed that when you take and plant seeds, you don't see little trees that you're putting in the ground. You just see a seed. And you put seeds. I put some seeds in an area that that, uh, that got messed up when they were repairing my roof and, and had put dirt in there, and then the dirt just... Wouldn't grow grass. I wonder why. So I went to the store and I bought some seeds and I sprinkled the seed on there last night. And then I said, okay, Lord, it's up to you now. Send the rain. And But the seed is down there. Now it's up to the rain to come and it's up to me to take a hose and water it too to make sure that it does get germinated. But it's up to God to turn that seed into grass. I, I can't do that. No matter what I do, I cannot make grass out of a seed. I can care for it. I can plant it. I can fertilize it. I can water it. But I cannot make grass out of a seed. Only that seed, under the hand of God, through the miracle that He puts in it, can it grow grass and cover the, the bare dirt that is causing a problem in the yard for runoff. Now, Paul changes the imagery here. I want you to notice that. He's now talking about a feel to talk about the same type of thing and he uses here like a farmer working in the field see me as a farmer that's the imagery he's using right here he uses himself see the pastor as getting up and the farmer takes and says we need to take and fix this now at the point when the trench was dug across my front yard and it was creating problems my son-in-law came from Houston and because I couldn't pick up those bags of, of dirt and all that kind of stuff and use a hoe and all that because I damaged my shoulder, I had to stand by and watch my son-in-law go out and pick up those big bags and pour them in the trenches and level them off. I had to see him do all of that. But did my responsibility stop by allowing him to do it? No, my responsibility was there the whole time. I encouraged him. I thanked him. And, and I rewarded him. But you know what? It's still my responsibility to make sure the yard grows. So I can buy seed. I can sprinkle seed. I can water water. I can pray for rain. I can do all of those things. He's using the farmer. And the pastor has the responsibility to see people know what the Word of God is. And that's why I teach you these passages. Your responsibility is to do something with that. Your responsibility is to let it germinate in you as you read the Word of God yourself, as you review the notes that you take. It's your responsibility to do that. Look at Matthew 13. The first nine verses there kind of talk about this subject. On the day that Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, such large cows gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. I want you to see Jesus. He's in charge. He's the teacher. And then he told them many things in parables. Now, another way of saying parables is he told them things that they couldn't possibly understand. I want you to understand that when you bring a friend to church, they're not a Christian, they can't possibly understand the things that I'm teaching them in the Word of God. Do you know that? Do you know that it's because of babes that I use illustrations and jokes and examples out of my life so that people can identify with those kind of things because they cannot understand the Word of God? On their own. 
They're not saved. They cannot understand. It is gobbledygook to them. And it will not get clear if they read it 10,000 times. Not going to happen. They have to have the Spirit of God inside them. But listen to me. You have the Spirit of God in you. And if you get it and study it, and the Spirit of God explains it to you, you can turn around and use illustrations and examples and your testimony and all those things to help them become interested in it so that they will hear the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will take and teach them what He's saying and they will want to become a Christian too. And you're right there to help them. And look at it, it says, He told them many things in parables. Consider the sower that went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. What happens? The birds come along, devour it. You bring a friend to church. He takes and comes to church, and he says, that was great. He says, well, I, don't, I'm not, I wasn't too keen on the sermon. Didn't really understand what he was talking about, but I liked the jokes he told. I liked the music. It kind of was my, my flavor. I, I, I like this. I, I like the fact that we went out to dinner. I like fellowship. But within an hour, they're not interested in coming back again. But you're their friend. You're the person that invited them. You need to take and sit down with them and encourage them and take the notes and, and go over the notes with them again. And they'll hear the Word of God the second time and you will become the teacher at that particular time. Not that you have to be a grand teacher or have to be a Bible knowledgeable person. You just have to have the Spirit of God living in you to do that. And God will take and water it and bring it about. And he goes on to say, other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. That's people that have been to church before. They come back, they hear something, and they say, you know, I like the way he took I never understood that in the Bible. He explained it in such a way I really understood it. That's, that's rocky soil. Still not a Christian. It might even be you. You might be a Christian, but the fact that you're not studying, you're not growing in the Lord, you're rocky soil, and it takes something to cause it to grow there. And the grass grew up quickly since the soil wasn't very deep. But when the sun came, it was scorched since it had no root and it withered away soon. The person comes to church, they hear the Word of God, they enjoy the service, they enjoy going out to eat, they enjoy uh, talking to you, but within an hour they've gotten everything they had. Because the seeds don't have a way of growing because the Holy Spirit's not in them. You're the friend that takes and helps them with that. Other seed fell among thorns. That's people that come to church and they've got difficulties and, and they really come and, and God speaks to them in such a way they hear the pastor say something that just takes and rings to them and they feel like they have hope now. They can make it. They're going to go far with this week. Their marriage is going to be repaired. Their, their health is going to get better. They, they begin to see things and hear about people that have gone through similar problems and they be, they're encouraged. It falls among thorns, and the thorns came back and choked it. They get out the next day, and the doctor says, Didn't I tell you not to go out in public? Didn't I tell you to stay home and, and stay by yourself? And they chastise for even what they did to try to help themselves, the encouragement they needed. And still other feet still on good ground that produced fruit. Some at a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. But some people hear it. And they begin to let it grow them. Let anyone who has ears listen, the Scripture tells us in Matthew 13. The seed is the Word of God. Let me tell you, the Word of God is the Bible. The Word of God is about, there is no other Word of God. This not, doesn't come in your dreams. It doesn't come to you from the pastor. The Word of God is always the Bible. That's only God speaking, whether it's in the church, whether it's in... Uh, a Bible study, whether it's in your personal study, it's always the Bible that's the Word of God. That's the only time you hear from God. You don't hear from God in your dreams. That's somebody else and it's not God. You hear from God when you're in the Word of God. That's when you hear from God. And the hearts of the people are different kinds of soil. The local church is a garden. That's what the local church is about. It's a garden. We come into the local church because it's a place where we can grow. It's a place where it's good soil. It's a place where there's less thorns and less thistles. It's still a place you can get injured. Gossip is one of the ways that can happen. Lack of friendship among the people of God is another way that chokes out the good word, the growth that we're beginning to make. Farms always need workers, though. 
How many of you have ever heard of a farm that only had one farmer? How much of a farm is it? A farm not only has a farmer, he hires workers, many workers to do the job. And the workers do the job that the farmer would have had to do by himself if he had a very tiny farm. But if he wants a bigger farm, he's got to have more workers. And so the church is a place where the pastor is the farmer. God sends him there to grow the people and to grow the church through the people. And the farmer has to have workers. He has to have people that take responsibility. And God lays on our heart. He lays on the pastor's heart, and He lays on your heart, and He lays on people that we appoint as called a nominating committee to look for people who have a sensitivity to jobs and to put them in it. Another one takes and acts as a gardener. One takes and acts as a as a worker in this. One prepares the soil. Another one plants the seed. Another one pulls up the weeds. And another one goes out and gets it up, gathers the harvest. And they all share in the harvest. They all, that's, that's missing out of your notes there. It says, but share in the harvest. They all share in the harvest should be in there. That word should be added in there. But all share in the harvest. We all Enjoy the benefits of God blessing the church and joy and blessing each other's life. There's nothing more exciting than to go to a birthday party. Whose birthday party is it? One person. Who enjoys a birthday party? Everybody that goes and participates. Who is it that gets saved? One person. Who enjoys it? All the people of God that participated in the party and see that person come. But we all have to be responsible in doing these things. And then I close with builders of God's church. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be builders of God's church. This passage teaches that. Look at verse 10 real quick. According to God's grace was given me, I've laid a foundation as a skilled master builder. That's the reason pastors have to go and be trained and educated and spend time learning the Word of God and speaking to God just like doctors have to before they can start giving you prescriptions and all that, they have to have a medical degree which proves that they have been to school and learned what to do. Pastors have to go through the same process. But each one is to be careful on how he builds on it. For no one can lay any other foundation than that which has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. If anybody builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and costly stones and wood or hay or straw... Each one's work will become obvious. Now, what he's meaning by this passage right here, and it really needs to be looked at, he builds on gold, silver, and costly stones. The church at that time, they killed Jesus because he interfered with their gold, he interfered with their silver, and their obvious thing. They made beautiful temples. They worshipped those temples. They had great uh, rules and regulations Scads of rules and regulations that they insisted on people to keep. They had people that were in high esteem robes and all of that, and everybody bowed down to them as if they were God. That was a silver and gold. And God says, that won't cut it. You build on that, that's all you're going to wind up with in the end. And he also said that there are other people that their work uh, is, their, they, uh, they build out of, Stones and woods and hay and straw. Some people come to church only for the purpose of, of fellowship. They only come to the church for the purpose of, of eating the snacks that we provide. Boy, they're hungry right now, aren't they? They're not able to do any of that kind of stuff like we were in the past before pre-COVID world. Some people come for the coffee. Barely able to do that right now. Some people come for the comfortable seats. More, more comfortable than sitting at home all the time. Some people come because they just want to get out of the house. They want to get around with people. That's what he's talking about right here. All of that is, might be important to you, but that's just wood, hay, or straw. And it won't last. It won't last. All you have to do is get somebody to hurt your feelings and you want to walk away. If anyone's work is going to survive, then it will bring a blessing to you. When we get to heaven and you say, well, you don't know what all I did to help in that church. I helped the church paint. I helped the church do this. I helped welcome the guests. I did this and I did that. And God says, baloney on every bit of that. None of that counts. Who'd you win to me? 
Who are you bringing to heaven with you? Whose name can you tell me right now that's going to step into heaven's gates one day and say, I am so thankful that Sue told me about Jesus and invited me to her church? Whose name? That's the thing that survived. When you stand before God in heaven and He says, Why should I let you into heaven? It's not what you say. I was a treasure. I was a Sunday school teacher. I was a pastor. I was this and I was that. None of those things will count for anything. Oh, they'll bring you reward because if you know how to play the cello, when we put together an orchestra in the church, you'll be invited to play the cello. When we take and put together a work day and you're good at driving a tractor, you'll get to drive the tractor. So once you get into heaven, none of these things will get you into heaven, but once you get into heaven, God will say, why don't you do the tractor driving? Why don't you do it over here and work in this area because you were good at that on earth and you learn how to do that. That when you get to do those kind of things, but it will not get you through heaven's gates in the first place. It won't get you into heaven. And that's what the Jerusalem church, the church of, of the early day, they were all obsessed in being Jews. They were all obsessed in being descendants of Israel, Jacob. None of that will get you into heaven. It doesn't matter if your parents were dynamic Christians. It doesn't matter if they were pastor. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. The only thing that matters is what you do with Jesus Christ yourself, whether you've been saved and whether you win people to Jesus and whether you disciple people. Those are things that when you stand before God in heaven, He says, why should I let you in? And you say, it's dependent upon Jesus. And Jesus says, yeah, it's dependent upon uh, me. But Larry was told about Jesus through them. Uh, Lana came to know Jesus through her. And so on and so forth. And God says, come on in. You're a blessing. You're a welcome here. And then he said, what did you do down there while on the earth that you enjoyed doing? And he said, well, I enjoyed doing this and this and this. And he says, well, continue it up here too. That won't get you into heaven. But it'll give you a head start when you get into heaven to enjoying your life up there in a different way. Some people are going to get to heaven and not have one single thing they do. They'll say, well, I'm bored up here. All, all I do is just sit around and sing praises to Jesus. You say, well, that will be enough of me. It'll get awful boring for eternity. But the things that you did for Jesus here, you'll be doing up there. It's just you won't have to be winning people to Jesus. That will all be finished. Once you get there, it's over. That work. Stories told to John Wesley. John Wesley was the founder of Methodism. John Wesley uh, dreamed one night that he died and went to hell. What a shock. He got to hell and he looked around and he said, uh, Are there any Presbyterians up here? And they said, yeah, plenty of them. Kind of smiled a little bit. He said, are there any Baptists up here? And they said, yeah, lots of them. He said, well, there are not any Methodists up here, are there? And they said, oh, yeah, we got lots of Methodists up here, too. John Wesley thought, what in the world? And then all of a sudden, bang, God took him to heaven. And he stood in heaven's gate, and he looked around, and he, he was staring around and he looked real proud and he, he, he had made it into heaven. God had said, come on in. As he looked around, there he took and he said, are there any Presbyterians up here? And they said, nope. And he said, I knew it. They're down in hell. And he said, are there any Baptists up here? And they said, nope, no Baptists up here either. He said, I knew it. That's why I started Methodism. And then he said, are there any Methodists up here? And they said, nope. And then he realized everything he'd done was for waste. And then he said, well, who is here? And they said, Christian. People that accepted Jesus Christ by faith and received by grace a gift from God, eternal life, they're here. It's not your denomination. It's not your membership. It's not the church you attend. It's the grace of God the gift of God that comes when we have faith and put our faith in Jesus Christ. I close with this. In heaven, there's going to be a crowd. There's a test. It's hurrying on earth. And people are thinking, many times pastors are thinking, if I can just get a big crowd coming to church, 
If I can just boast that I got the biggest church in the world, if I got if I have a big crowd when I stand in front of Jesus, he's gonna say, Whoa, man, you don't know how good this makes me feel. I've been waiting to stand in your presence. You had such a big church down there. I never had that big a church, Jesus will say. Wow, I feel grateful that I'm able to stand in your place. Do you know what? That won't count a penny in heaven. Not a penny. You know what God will say? How many of them were Christians? I know how many of you say were members, but how many of them were Christians? How many of them were winning people to Jesus and discipling them? How many people were Christians? People that are based in Jesus Christ, saving people and discipling them. How many did you have? In many cases, those big churches that scurried to get a big crowd together sacrificed on the quality of who they were bringing in. They have large roles, large buildings, beautiful structures, just like the Jews did. But there's no substance in the basis of their memberships. My dear friend, we all like to accomplish something big. Nothing wrong with that. But we ought to be very careful on what we're building. Are we building on gold and silver and precious stones? Are we building on just trash? We ought to be building on one thing and one thing only. And that's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And teaching people about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and how to take and receive that gift from God to bless other people's lives. Would you stand together with me?